you think your life would be a good movie? That's really up to others. <clears throat> I've had a lot of fun. I'm Mike McGowan. I'm a former FBI special agent. We had an opportunity as law enforcement to make an investigation against the world's most powerful drug organization, in which we targeted the Sinaloa cartel and Chapo Guzman. So taking almost up to a year to prepare this, we finally set the first meeting to take place in Florida in early 2010. If you were to write a script from that day, this is how it would look. The Sinaloa cartel was responsible for hundreds of murders in Mexico and billions of dollars of narcotics being transferred throughout the world. And I remember clearly to this day that the hairs on the back of my neck stood up because to have an opportunity in 2009 to take a run at Guzman and the Sinaloa cartel was unheard of. When we first began this investigation, we had a cooperating witness who came to us and said, I can give you the Sinaloa cartel. He chose to cooperate with the FBI in order to have some of his property, which had been seized in his earlier cases, returned to him and his family. Chapo Guzman wanted to set up a pipeline from Mexico into Europe to supply all of Europe. So we put a plan into effect in which he believed we would be drug traffickers out of Europe and specifically Italy. After the informant went into Mexico, he was able to convince the Sinaloa cartel that the United States would be okay to have meetings only. We wouldn't buy or sell drugs in the meetings. We would simply be businessmen getting together to have discussions in a neutral country. We intended to represent that we were a Sicilian crime organization from Italy. And the intention was to use a very experienced undercover agent who spoke Sicilian. That agent unfortunately retired shortly before the investigation started. So at the last minute, we had our Sicilian speaker not available. We looked around and decided eventually that I would represent the head of the organization from Sicily. That's a little bit difficult. I obviously don't speak Sicilian. I sometimes struggle with English, but working in concert with three Spanish-speaking undercover agents, we felt we could overcome the language barrier needed to target the Sinaloa cartel. The meeting takes place in an oceanfront condominium overlooking the Atlantic Ocean in Florida. You looked out for miles and miles, beautiful ocean. You take out wine, you take out food, you take out photographs. You turn on a soccer match. We spent a lot of time preparing the room. The room is also equipped with audio and video recording, and each agent has a responsibility of knowing where the cameras are, where you want the subjects to sit, so it's, it's pretty much scripted and we went through it carefully. So myself and the three other FBI undercover agents had specific and different roles in this case. The first gentleman that I worked with was a longtime friend of mine who is an expert in transportation. His job was to get contraband from point A to point B and he knew all shipping routes, uh, transportation, systems, etc. This gentleman had worked in South Florida for many, many years and had the South Florida look, clothing. He had uh, the Tommy Bahamas and the right sunglasses, the right car. When you work around the country, there's certain parts where every criminal looks the same and South Florida is one of those. We had a second gentleman who was named Antonio. He was responsible for our ports uh, in foreign countries. We knew we were gonna receive large amounts of cocaine, so we had decided that we were gonna use ports or shipping as opposed to airlines. So we had ports that we use literally all over the world outside of the United States that we have access to through uh, foreign law enforcement cooperation. And then the third undercover was my underling, Patricio. He spoke both Spanish and Italian. He was going to replace me. I was the old man. I was the head of the organization, soon to be retired. He was my right-hand man, my most trusted associate. If anyone spoke to me privately, it would be Patricio, my number two. So again, it's very important to set up this dynamic that they see a pecking order, they see a criminal organization that has a chain of command in it. 
And we have to convince a member of the Sinaloa cartel we're criminals, just like they are. They're very, very cognizant of who appears to be real and who, who does not. So we had to sell ourselves as a criminal organization, and that's why we mirrored many of the same roles that the Sinaloa cartel had. And representing the Sinaloa cartel was a gentleman named Manuel Jesus Guzman, who was identified as a blood relative of Chapo Guzman. He would be Chapo's spokesman during these negotiations. Manuel Guzman entered the United States. We sent the informant to pick him up at the Miami International Airport and deliver him to our oceanfront condominium for negotiations. So as we're waiting for the meeting to happen, as I said, I was dressed appropriately as a crime boss. And I noticed my friends and fellow agents were nervous, as was I. And it was typical and, and natural to be nervous. We had a lot expected of us. And just prior to the Manuel arriving at the condominium, I went in to use the men's room and double check everything. And I looked behind the door and I found um, a gaudy purple velour bathrobe that for some reason I thought would fit the scene better. So without telling the other agents, I got out of my $5,000 suit and I put on this hideous velour bathrobe. I walked out into the room and the place cracked up. Everybody went nuts laughing. It really broke the ice. Everybody calmed down. And at first I was going to go back and change. And then I said, he would never suspect this is the FBI. So I kept on the purple velour bathrobe. Uh, for the remainder of the meeting. You have to understand, when you're an undercover agent, you have to do things that the bad guys don't expect FBI agents would do. Manuel arrives. He was dressed in a business suit as if it was a uh, important business meeting. So Manuel enters the room in the company of the informant. He's now meeting the three undercovers. I'm out on the deck sunning myself in my purple bathrobe, and after five or 10 minutes, I don't see him coming out where he was supposed to be introduced to me. So I went inside and lo and behold, we found out that Manuel has a fear of heights, which we didn't know. So here we are 30 stories up on the ocean and he's hunkered down in a corner of the building and he won't come anywhere near the camera range. It took a while, but we were able to calm him down at least enough to come out and sit on the couch and begin negotiations with us. I make a point of introducing myself and then walking immediately away from him because I don't want to talk to him at that point. You have to understand, we set up relationships, so if I was the old man or I was the, the El Jefe, the boss, I wouldn't negotiate with Manuel. I'd only negotiate with Chapo. And I stayed out on the porch. I ignored him for the first couple of hours. So the other three undercovers have the responsibility for making him comfortable. I also had a very attractive female FBI agent with me who was my date for the meeting. And so I'm literally getting a suntan and putting lotion on, having a drink, relaxing with my lady friend. It's, you try to make it as natural as possible. Patricio, my number two, would come out, whisper in my ear, and I would whisper something back and send the message in. From where I was outside, I could see in and I could see the transformation in his uneasiness roll away. At one point he started uh, slapping the hand of one of the undercovers like they were, they were old buddies. I could tell by the body language that things were going well. When you negotiate a massive drug deal, it takes hours. It's a very long negotiation. And I waited until it was going well until I came in. And when I did come in, as we had all agreed, I was never gonna speak directly to Manuel, so I would just sit there and listen get up, go get something to eat. I would, I wasn't being rude to him, but I wasn't waiting on every word. That's what my underlings are there for. He offered to send an initial shipment of like 5,000 kilos, which if you know anything about cocaine, that's a lot of cocaine. And we said, no, it's the first deal when no one's doing 5,000 kilos. So here you have cops turning down the Sinaloa cartel. A lot of cops would say, yeah, give, give me all five. That's not how, drug negotiations go. We had to lower the quantities we were interested in. We wanted to set up a system that would last for years and years, not just one deal. It's like any business deal, initial meeting, the groups hit it off, 
They've thrown some numbers back and forth, and now they're going to go regroup and have more discussions. He didn't even want to leave. He was having such a good time. Seriously, 2011, we began to exchange what's called test loads with the Sinaloa cartel. They would send vessels from Mexico to Europe. No drugs would be on those vessels. There were plantains, pineapples, everything under the sun except cocaine. But you have to do that. If you're a real drug trafficker, that's how it works. So we had to be patient and pay for this. After th almost three years of investigation in July of 2012, the Sinaloa cartel shipped us approximately 700 pounds, I believe it's 346 kilograms of cocaine, which in conjunction with the Spanish National Police, the FBI seized in Algeciras, Spain. As a result of those arrests, and subsequent investigation, we were able to charge in the United States, Chapo and eight of his executive board members with drug trafficking. Even though Chapo was in Mexico, we couldn't get our hands on him at that point. He was indicted in our case, which was later one of a number of cases that led to Guzman's eventual extradition into the United States.